Thank you so much for having me here as a speaker on this very first event. Uh, I'm very grateful. I'm here in Bhutan now for a year and a half, working as a technical advisor. And uh, I'd like to share with you means of building sustainable within Bhutan for a future, hopefully, which we all can agree on is not so easy. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us as uh, a world, as a human species, and uh, especially here in this developing uh, stage you are in, in Bhutan, you have a lot of challenges. The challenges I see here is that we are in a developing country where you have um, such a great history of living sustainable, which is really similar to the place I'm from, Alaska, uh, where we have extreme cold temperatures, but people have managed to live sustainable for thousands of years. There's two, three thousand years of history in Alaska for sustainable living. But nowadays that has completely changed and uh, in Bhutan it's the same problem. Basically we are facing uh, energy costs which are really cheap still here, but at one point that will change. So um, this is the mountain high Highlander village of Laya, which I have been to several times by now. So I'd like to take this as an example of your typical remote village here where the problem is that resources are very sparse. Heating is still done a lot with wood. I mean, electricity moves up to a lot of these places, but overall uh, it's very difficult to stay really comfortable, which I think is one of the problems um, where we are going to see a big shift which needs to happen here in Bhutan if we want to really get to energy efficient buildings because this is kind of like the normal comfort in these regions and even in uh, places like Paro or Timpu you still have a lot of buildings where in the winter time when it's really cold you only have one room where it's sort of comfortable and uh, that's acceptable and that's kind of like the way things are and I've noticed this on a lot of discussions I had that that I think might be one of the big hurdles to overcome that we don't need to be uncomfortable in the building um, that does not necessarily need to be I've seen uh, a lot of good use of solar um, I've, I've seen this in rural Alaska the same way um, it's obviously not the way it is intended but it works so <laughs> Um, I think the key we need to understand is that especially in a place like this we have so much tradition and so much history that we need to together think about design. How can we design proper buildings, high energy efficient buildings and still maintain your history and your culture and uh, it all starts with the design process really to figure out all of these answers and that is never a linear process it is something which we have so much knowledge by now and we can share throughout the world on building in all kinds of climates but the design process really needs to be very thorough and it needs to be proper so that with good design we can build high efficient buildings but in the end it really all starts with the design uh, buildings, we spend so much time in them and they should always be designed for people, not for the building itself or the architect who wants to make a certain statement about something. It should be about comfort, it should be about tradition, it should be about being in a place which gives us a true home, a true shelter. So design is, needs to be appropriate for the climate. Uh, we've seen a lot of this uh, in the place I'm from in the 50s and 60s in Alaska. They built the same houses all over the place to the same codes like in California. We have 40, 50 below Celsius in the winter times. So it's much colder and these buildings never function properly. Uh, so the thing to overcome in cold climates is to insulate it properly and insulate it so that the heat takes long enough to leave the building to be basically uh, sustainable. Sustainable, I mean basically think about a beautiful sunny day 
where during the day you will basically gain a lot of sunlight energy into the building and at night you're going to lose all of it. Overcoming that cold temperature at night is basically where insulation comes into place to keep that heat in the building until the sun comes back out and we maintain comfort. And right with uh, insulation needs to come air tightness. A drafty home is always a cold home no matter how much insulation we place in. If we have a lot of uh, areas where the air can just simply travel through, it creates uncomfortable conditions for one and on the other it also creates uh, problems within the building assemblies by introducing moisture. Warm air, cold air creates condensation, creates moisture, creates problems. Lots of problems in the 70s and buildings which have been built like this. So insulation and air tightness put together creates comfort comfort which all of us would enjoy uh, if we really would know how comfortable buildings can be and uh, in a place like this here where it's cold in the winter time heating is a problem so heating needs to be uh, accounted for and uh, the basic building standard to which uh, I work with which a lot of building scientists throughout the world by now uh, go back to is called the passive house standard which comes from Germany developed over 20 years ago. It's basically super insulating a building, creating air tightness, and uh, with air tightness, we also need to introduce mechanical ventilation. We need to breathe in the building, so we need to uh, somehow bring fresh air into the house. And we do that by mechanical ventilation so that we can recover the heat by 80, 90%. And then we have uh, appropriate glazing in the windows, basically, which bring in the uh, free energy from the sun into the building and with the right building materials on the inside we can store it temporarily. So the first passive house really in the Norse, I always bring this up, it was really the igloo. Two, three thousand years ago people already knew how to build properly in this climate. It's airtight and it's very well insulated and even at 40 below zero uh, you have zero degrees inside just by being inside with your own body heat. So just to give you an idea where I'm from, this is winter, a good day, minus 48, a bad day, minus 60. So it's extremely cold. Uh, I always say people in Bhutan don't know what cold means. And uh, in 2010, I built a zero energy building in Fairbanks, Alaska, basically in this climate, which creates its own energy basically throughout the year, stores the heat for the winter time in a big heat storage system. You see the solar collectors on the top for uh, electricity and hot water. Uh, and it's over the year, annually speaking, zero energy. There is no heating system in there. It basically functions by itself. Thermal shutters close the windows because of the extreme cold climate. So why I want to bring this up, we can build good buildings. Even in the most extreme climates, we can build really good buildings. If we apply proper building science, if we understand not the laws of physics, building physics, we can easily build good buildings in any climate, in any climate zone. The keystones really is moisture control, very important for the longevity of the buildings. If we introduce moisture into buildings, we create problems with mold, with building failures in uh, timber, uh, and create all kinds of problems. That was a huge problem in the 70s when super insulation was really born. That's when a lot of uh, buildings had so many problems that the whole movement basically died after a few years. Nowadays we understand all of this and uh, we can build properly. Moisture control, air tightness and insulation. For cold climates, I can not stress this enough, insulation is the key. Insulation is the only investment you can make in a building in a cold climate. What from day one will basically be a payback, which always will work for you. We'll never need any maintenance will always work for 100 years, it will be there, do its thing, and keep the heat in the building. And somehow we need to create energy balance within these buildings, and that's basically the whole science behind it, the balance points between the losses and the gains. The gains we get from uh, things like lighting people for uh, anything basically which emits heat within the building. Uh, everything is calculated in as a gain basically carefully in the energy modeling. And then the losses are basically 
the amount of heat which we will lose through the building assemblies. Windows, obviously, you know, they're much faster than wall assemblies. Roof, foundation, all a little bit different. And then also the ventilation that can be huge if there is no heat recovery, or it can be minimized by modern mechanical ventilation where we are able to keep 90% of the heat basically within the building. Um, we're using basically sophisticated computer modeling to figure out exactly what these answers are, how much insulation you would need here in Bhutan in a certain climate region. And uh, basically we construct the entire building uh, in a 3D energy model and then we tweak the dials to figure out what type of insulation works best, what uh, uh, glazing is appropriate and where we uh, size the windows. All of these questions basically are figured out in a computer model and optimized. And then uh, in doing construction we make sure that we verify all of these things with modern tools like uh, basically air tightness is tested during construction uh, by pressurizing the building. We basically blow it, uh, depressurize or pressurize up the building during construction and we fix all of the leaks whilst we still can access all of the building assemblies. Uh, thermal cameras, the same thing, we're figuring out thermal bridges, uh, enneometers basically to figure out exactly the airflow requirements and, and all of this. So modern tools of construction which are readily available nowadays. And then we carefully analyze the site for solar access. Uh, we have uh, little handheld computers which basically with one push of a button within one minute can tell me exactly the sun pass for the entire year in this, in this particular site. And I can orient the building, I can design the building appropriately so that we can gain all of this free energy from the sun. So with the free energy that's to me, I think the most beautiful thing about designing a proper building, if we are uh, utilizing this energy, it's always there in the wintertime, especially here in Bhutan. I mean, I marvel about how beautiful it is. In the winter, it gets cold and you have all of the sunlight, the clouds move away. It's completely different than what I face in Alaska. In the winter, it gets cold and the sun completely goes away for two or three months. So with proper design, basically, you can capture all of this free energy from the sun. Good glazing, appropriate glazing, brings the energy into the building. We keep the energy with the insulation long enough in the building that we overcome the cold night. And the next day, when the free energy comes back up, it reheats the building. It's fairly simple. Uh, this is the law library, basically, which Karuna Foundation, which uh, hired me to be here as an advisor. Uh, is currently constructing up at Pangbisa. And just to give you an idea about some numbers for energy efficiency, uh, so this building was designed and uh, also modeled by the Passive House Standard. We used uh, the energy model basically to tweak the dials. And uh, if we're looking at this building as a baseline, that would be typical Bhutan construction, like every building built in Timpu or anywhere else right now. For this building, that would be basically 164 kilo BTUs per square foot per year to heat the building. And then uh, we ran some analysis on how much insulation should we put into this building. So we went 15 centimeters to 10. So 100 mm is kind of what we settled on. And as you can see on the numbers, there isn't really a whole lot of gain going much more in this climate. So what does this all mean really mm -hmm. you know, for this building? Basically, from 164, we went down to 10.5 by proper design, proper uh, use of insulation, air tightness, and heat recovery. So we have a factor 15, basically, of energy reduction, uh, which is always our goal, at least a factor 10. Uh, anything 80 to 90 percent, in my opinion, in, in this day and age is useless. We need to go all the way. We need to be at least 80 to 90 percent over baseline for the simple reason that at this level of insulation and air tightness, we can cut out the mechanical systems and we can minimize the one thing which failed us uh, too many times, <laughs> technology. Uh, any heating system we put into a building, 10 years from now we're going to replace. The insulation which we put in will be there for 100 years. So let's forget about the expensive heating system, mechanical system, 
and we take the money from that and we put it in the insulation. And in the end, really, it's mathematically not that much more expensive because we are reducing the one component which will fail. The plumbers don't like it because they don't have anything to fix in 10 years, but the homeowner really likes it because the house simply works by itself. Nothing can break down. So last not but not least, here's one of my favorite cartoons. And Bhutan has such a great potential for that. There's so much solar potential in this country. Uh, it would be so easy to build truly zero energy buildings anywhere here because you have so much sunlight available when it becomes cold. And it's really just a matter of uh, adding a little bit of renewable energies to these efficient buildings and you would have a truly sustainable built environment. This is, I think, the future, not just for Bhutan, but for the world. Anything uh, built forward really needs to go this direction. Living buildings which produce or exceed even uh, the ability to produce more energy, produce their own food. Uh, I mean, there's big projects happening all over the world uh, where huge living buildings are being constructed right now, which create their own energy, create their own food sources, create a really healthy environment. That's the future. This is where we need to go. We need to have living buildings and uh, we need to love the sun. That's really one of my key messages I always try to bring across. That's the only free energy we have. Uh, it will always be there. Certain people really don't like that fact because they always want to extract money from people and drive, fly around the world in their jets. But the sun is here for all of us and uh, I personally really become to uh, be a huge fan of solar energy, seeing what is possible even in extreme cold climates like Alaska. And it would be uh, so easy to really come up with very good buildings in Bhutan uh, that can sustain basically a future where energy will become such a big problem. And all of that said, basically the key message about all of this is that Bhutan, as such a small country, has the ability to create policy to make this happen, work with building specialists, scientists, and good designers, which you have in this country, to uh, collaborate and come up with a good method of moving into the future sustainably, where you don't make the same mistakes we have done in the Western world for the last 30, 40 years, and now just come to this conclusion where you can uh, make this happen now at this point in time and you can come up with recommendations from the top down which people in the field in the normal society just don't know about and uh, they can simply embrace uh, a future which shelter at least will be sustainable and 10 years from now when hydropower will not be almost free but will be on a world scale on a normal level uh, people will be able to utilize their buildings without having to be cold because they can't afford their power bill. I mean, Bhutan will face that challenge, guaranteed. And uh, some years uh, in the future, energy costs will be very expensive. And then everything you're doing right now will be very difficult to maintain. Any of the new buildings being built right now without insulation, without air tightness, will be very uncomfortable. And all of these little electrical heaters in every room will be too expensive to operate. Thank you.